were you assigned at the DCI laboratory in February of 2024? I would have been a criminalist in the DNA section. Did you have an opportunity to receive some evidence in this case, the case of the um, where Melody Hoffman is the homicide victim and Mr. Louisma is charged as the defendant? Yes, I did examine evidence related to this matter. As a result of receiving evidence related to this case, did you formulate a report that contained your conclusions and interpretation of, those evidence, of that evidence? For this case, I did author two DNA reports. If we could, honor, Your Honor, we'd like to uh, show the witness what's marked as State's Exhibit number 19A. Do you see that in front of you, Carly? Yes. What is State's Exhibit number 19A? State's Exhibit 19A <clears throat> appears to be a copy of one of the DNA reports issued in this case. And how many pages is that uh, DNA report you're referring to? For this DNA, it's um, identified as D report number two. It is a total of seven pages. Does this also contain an additional report? Yes, um, there is also what has been identified as lab report number three, which is the second DNA report that I issued in this case. And what's the date of the second report? The second report that I issued was finalized on September 11th of 2024. And then what was the date of the first report? The date that the first report was finalized was April 11th of 2024. Even though I think we intended to have 19A and 19B, it looks like everything's in 19A. Is that right? I did not see another um, red or a state's exhibit tag on it. I only saw um, 19A. Your Honor, we move to admit state's exhibit number 19A. Any objection to 19A? No objection. Exhibit 19A is admitted. <clears throat> and we'd like to publish that when we um, get the opportunity, Your Honor. 19A is published. So, Carly, I think uh, the, easy, the easiest way to do this is just to go through this report, and you're going to, I'm going to ask you some questions, and you're going to tell us about what we're seeing on your report, okay? Okay. All right. And this report may reference some items that um, we haven't seen pictures yet here, but um, it's our understanding here that you can't come back tomorrow, right? Correct. So we got to get you in today. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and start here. Um, this says lab case number on it and a report date. So is this the first report that you, um, you compiled and um, formulated in this case? Yes. And it looks like it refers to your agency, and then who's the case officer in this report? It is listed as Special Agent Ryan Kedley. And does he also work for the DCI? Yes. And then as far as subjects here, we have McKinley, Louisma, and Dakota, Lyle, Van Patten. Is that your understanding that those are the, the suspects or defendants in the, this analysis? From my understanding, yes. Those, um, that information is filled out by the submitting agency prior to submitting, so that's not something that I, um, that I decided or I put on the report. And then the victim in this case is known as Melody Hoffman, is that right? Yes. Okay, going to the first uh, entry here, we'll say uh, items as described by submitting agency. Um, on February 20th, 2024, the following items were submitted to, who's Noah Eelnant? He is one of the individuals that works in the evidence room at the crime lab. So would he have been the one who received the items from law enforcement and then um, began the process of going through that protocol to um, collect and preserve the items for your later analysis? 
Yes, for the items that are listed underneath. Um, it looks like laboratory items three through 10, uh, he is the individual that received them in the evidence room. And in this instance, laboratory items number three through 10 um, are the same as the agency number, is that right? Yes. And does that indicate, um, at least based on your understanding, that the agency that submitted these items was also the DCI? From my understanding, that is the, uh, what happened in these items. And what items were submitted? Laboratory and agency item number three was a box containing two swabs of red stain from the trunk lid of the Honda. Lab and agency item number four was two sets of Ozark Trail gloves with red stains. Laboratory and agency items five was a pink shirt with red stains and duct tape from the trunk of the Honda. Laboratory and agency items six was hair stuck to duct tape from trunk of Honda. Lab and agency items number seven was green paracord from trunk of Honda. Agency and lab items number eight was a pocket knife with red stains from Honda. Laboratory and agency items nine was a box containing swabs from McKinley Luisma. And lab and agency items 10 were paper fold containing fingernail scrapings from McKinley Luisma. Did you find when you ultimately received these items for analysis that these were fairly adequate descriptions of the items that you uh, examined? Yes. Okay. And then on February 22nd, 2024, it looks like some more items were submitted to Brandy Lane. Is she also an evidence tech at DCI Lab? Yes, she is. Okay. What items were submitted on February 22nd? Laboratory item 11 is agency item 1 was a item containing right fingernail clippings collected at time of autopsy. Laboratory item 12, agency item 2, was an item containing left fingernail clippings collected at time of autopsy. Laboratory item 13, agency item 3, was sealed sex assault kit bearing the name of Melody Hoffman taken at the time of autopsy exam. Laboratory item 14, agency item 4, was underwear of the victim. Laboratory item 15, agency item 5, was a blood standard card taken at time of autopsy exam. <clears throat> and did these descriptions also um, adequately represent the items that you examined? Yes. And then finally, on March 7th of 2024, it looks like uh, some more items were submitted, this time to Melissa Ozemek. Is she also a lab tech at DCI Lab? Yes, she works in the evidence room as well. Now, what was submitted on March 7th of 2024? Laboratory item 16, agency item 4, was a swab from unknown flaky yellow substance at Morgan Creek Park. Laboratory item 17, agency item 5, was swabs of unknown dried fluid on parking lot at Morgan Creek Park. Laboratory item 18, agency item 6, was swab from unknown amber substance north of picnic table. Lab item 19, agency item seven, was a swab of unknown substance from south of picnic table. Laboratory item 20, agency item nine, was clear frame, framed glasses. Laboratory item 21, agency item 10, was gray Nike shoes. Laboratory item 22, agency item 11, was gray sweatpants. Laboratory item 23, agency item 18, was forest green Under Armour sweatshirt. Laboratory item 24, agency item 34, was pink Hey Dude shoes. Laboratory item 25, agency item 35, was black capri pants. Laboratory item 26, agency item 42, was a multicolor cell phone case. Laboratory item 28, agency item 52, was a black beanie. Lab number 29, agency number 56, was Van Patten buckle swab. And then on March 7th of 2024, 
it says the following items were submitted again to Melissa Ozemek at the DCI lab. What was submitted on that day? That was laboratory item 30, agency item 67, known swabs, Logan Kimpton. It looks like with some of these later items here, there was a different lab number than an agency number. Does that indicate to you that um, those items that don't have the same number were submitted by an outside agency like the Marion Police Department? Yes, those items likely came from not the DCI. They may have um, different agency item numbers because they were submitted and inventoried by a different agency. Let's turn to the next page here now. <clears throat> the next entry you have says that photographs were taken of item 7, um, which if we go back is the uh, green paracord from the trunk of the Honda, is that right? Yes. Okay, so tell us, um, tell us what you're doing here and what you're noting as far as your uh, testing at this point in time in the report. Do you mean just to explain what each of those paragraphs mean? Or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that first one says photographs were taken of item 7 by forensic science technician Marcy Batchelor. Just means photos were taken of item 7, which was the paracord. The next one says, if an evidentiary profile referenced in this report is stated to be associated with the DNA profile of a specific individual, then the DNA profiles of other individuals profiled in this case can be considered to have been eliminated as possible DNA donors to that specific evidentiary profile. In other words, that means if somewhere in the report it says a DNA profile was associated to an individual, Everybody else that has been profiled in this case can be eliminated as being a donor to that profile. Okay, thank you. What do we have next? Testing was not attempted. Explain that. Testing was not attempted on every stain on the submitted items. That just means on some of the items that are in the report, I didn't screen every single stain on every single item in this case. Um, and screening is referencing uh, body fluid screening. So would that um, statement then is that put in there to note that even though there might be an item of evidence that contains, let's say, multiple uh, stains that have been identified as blood, you're not going to test every stain? So, yeah, it can mean that there may be numerous stains on an item. I may only screen a few of those stains. Um, so it just says that not every stain on every single item was screened for a um, bodily fluid. It might be an obvious answer, but can you explain why you don't test every area? Um, if an item has, um, for instance, if it has just one area, maybe of red-brown staining, I will screen that area. If an item has numerous stains, I may take a representative sample of those and just screen different areas on that item. Try to take a representative er or number of samples um, given the case information um, just to kind of streamline our testing. And we do know that we can always go back at a later time if additional testing is requested. So at least initially, is it fair to say that um, if you were to test every area that, that of, a, of an item that has blood stains, that, that could um, revolt, result in a lot of um, duplicitous work, un maybe unnecessary work, and certainly additional work? It would certainly be additional work if we screened every single stain on every single item in every single case. Okay, moving on, um, talk about the screening. This says the evidence was screened for the presence of bodily fluids by chemical testing and or antibody antigen testing. That statement just says that some of the items um, within the report I did do body fluid screening on. What kind of bodily fluids are you looking for in that screening? Um, in our laboratory we have body fluid screening tests for blood, seminal fluid, and saliva. Talk about the differential extraction procedure for stains containing seminal fluid. This says the differential extraction procedure for a stain containing seminal fluid attempts to isolate sperm DNA from DNA of other sources. The procedure results in two fractions, one called sperm fraction and the other called epithelial fraction. The sperm fraction is expected to be mainly of male origin. However, some non-sperm DNA may be present. The epithelial fraction may contain, excuse me, may consist of DNA from both seminal and non-seminal origin. 
So this statement just explains um, in items that may contain seminal fluid, we do a different type of extraction procedure where we attempt to separate the sperm fraction from the epithelial fraction or non-sperm fraction. So just kind of explaining that process and to say that a differential extraction was performed in this case. So basically, if you do find the presence of seminal fluid on, as a result of the screening, then you're going to extract that from that seminal fluid what you can find in terms of the sperm, what you can identify as a sperm fraction, and then separate that from epithelial, which is more like skin. So. Sure. So screen, we will do screening tests. Depending on our screening tests, we may still do the differential extraction, even if it's negative for seminal fluid. And then moving on, we will do a differential extraction on a sample and attempts to separate any sperm DNA from non-sperm DNA. Finally, the evidence was processed for DNA typing by capillary electrophoresis. Tell us about that. So that's, again, saying evidence was processed for DNA typing by capillary electrophoresis using the Applied Biosystems Global Filer PCR Amplification Kit. That just says that items of evidence in this case were processed through the DNA workflow, and this is the type of testing that we use in our laboratory. PCR testing. Correct. Can you give us a general version of what PCR testing involves? Yes, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Um, this particular one's talking about amplification, which is a step of the DNA process where we make millions and millions of copies of the DNA. And then in that PCR process, those that contain, this kit contains the areas of DNA that we're testing in our laboratory. So we don't test everybody's, all their DNA. We target specific areas um, of the DNA. And that is just explaining the kit that we use and the process we use to get there. So this amplification, you make millions of copies of DNA that you find. What, in order to be able to see it better? So what that amplification does is it makes millions of copies. And therefore, the next part, the capillary electrophoresis, it is separating the DNA based on its size. So in the end, we get a DNA profile, which is just a visual representation of the areas of DNA that we test. So when you're able to get a profile, does that then aid you in the ability to um, compare what you do find to a known profile? Yes. So we will examine all of our evidentiary profiles. We will determine if they are interpretable. It may be the whole profile is interpretable or just a portion of it. And then if it is interpretable, we will do the interpretation and then compare to any known reference samples submitted in the case. And what that allows us to do is to say whether um, a person that was uh, profiled in the case could be included or possibly excluded as a contributor to a specific evidentiary profile that is developed. Okay. And we might get back to, to that as it relates to your findings. But let's start with uh, your findings here and the results of your examination. It starts with nine, which is... Uh, noted in your description as a box containing two swabs from McKinley Louisma. What did you find when you examined the box containing two swabs from McKinley Louisma? So for, it says DNA profiles were developed from the known buckle samples of McKinley Louisma. He is laboratory item number, that is laboratory item number nine. And then you also examined laboratory item number 29 and 30, which are indicated to be the Van Patten buckle swab and the Logan Kimpton buckle swab. Correct. So DNA profiles were developed from the known buckle samples of Dakota Van Patten and Logan Kimpton as well. So this gives you that known pro profile of these individuals to compare to your findings, right? Yes, for those three individuals. Now, the next thing you examined was uh, lab number 15, which is a blood standard card taken at the time of the autopsy exam of Melody Hoffman. What did you find as a result of that? A DNA profile was developed from the known blood sample of Melody Hoffman. And so now you have a known sample of Melody to compare your findings. Correct. Okay. So the next thing we, we have here is, is number three, which is a box containing two swabs of the red stain from the trunk lid of the Honda. What did you find there? <clears throat> Excuse me. Screening indicated the presence of blood on the swabs from the Honda trunk lid. The DNA profile developed matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The probability of finding this profile in a population of unrelated individuals chosen at random would be less than one out of 21 non-million. So this number, one out of 21 non-million, 
numbers like this appear a lot in your report. I don't think we're going to talk about each number, what it means, but for the first one, can you tell us the significance of less than one out of 21 known million? So that um, portion, that sentence about the statistic, what that does is it gives an estimate to the rarity of the profile. So it's just, in other words, you can kind of phrase it in other words, saying if I had 21 non-million um, grains of sand that are all different, I would only expect to find one particular grain of sand that I'm looking for one time. Out of all 21 non-million opportunities, I would only find it one time. So it's an estimate of how rare this profile is. And so instead of sand, in this case we're talking about individuals. Correct. So you would expect to find a similar deep DNA profile on less than one out of 21 known million individuals. Correct. So if there was a population of 21 non million individuals, I would only expect to find this person one time. So in terms of prof comparing that to profiles, if we had 21 non million profiles, I would only expect to find this one profile one time. And that profile was associated to Melody Hoffman. And then just kind of touching on this number a little bit more here, uh, do you know how many zeros are followed after one no million? One non million would be the number one followed by 30 zeros. And obviously this exceeds the human population by a lot. Yes, for reference, the world's population is approximately 8 billion. Is that why in the same sentence you're able to put the DNA profile developed match the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman? So the reason I can say it matches is that from the DNA profile that was developed from the evidentiary profile, the swabs from the Honda trunk lid, at each area of DNA that we tested, the DNA that was developed, the markers, were the same at every location as they were in the known buckle, or known blood sample from Melody Hoffman. So each location, every the DNA that was detected was the similar in the known sample compared to that evidence profile. And you'd only expect to see that same profile in less than one out of 21 known million people? Yes, in a population of unrelated individuals chosen at random would be less than one out of 21 non million. So does this indicate a, a, a finding then that the blood on the swabs of the Honda trunk lid matched the DNA of Melody Hoffman? I can say that screening indicated the presence of blood on those swabs and the DNA profile that was developed matched the DNA, the known blood sample of Melody Hoffman. Okay, moving on to item number four, which is identified as two sets of Ozark Trail gloves with red stains. Can you tell us about uh, your testing of this item and the findings you made. Item four contained four gloves. Screening indicated the presence of blood on four areas of glove one. DNA testing was attempted on swabs from one of these areas. The DNA profile developed from the outside pointer finger area indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. Okay, so let's talk about that finding here so we know what that means. Um, first, you said that you identified the uh, glove as glove one and then you called it item 4.1. So when we're talking about the first glove you examined, you gave it the name 4.1. Yes. And then on Item 4.1, you found the presence of blood in four areas, is that right? Yes, screening was positive on four areas of glove one for blood. And then we're looking at the outside pointer finger area as one of those areas, and that's called 4.11. Yes. 4.1.1. Um, and so in that area where screening indicated the presence of blood, uh, you were able to uh, identify a DNA profile. Yes. And that DNA profile matched that of Melody Hoffman. It indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. So you found the presence of two individuals, and the major one, the one that had more DNA to be able to identify. Is that right? Yes. Matched Melody Hoffman. But the other one, you said the additional factors were insufficient. Tell us about that. 
That just means that second person, I can say that there's two people contributing DNA to the profile that was developed. Uh, the second one, the minor contributor, there just was not enough DNA information present in that profile to draw any interpretations, and therefore I cannot compare to any known reference samples in the case. So, you, so can you say as a result of that then that there was definitely the presence of somebody else's DNA there, but there just wasn't enough information gathered to be able to develop a profile that you can compare to a known person? Yes. The next finding says the DNA profile developed from the swabs from the inside of glove one, 4.12 indicated a mixture of at least three individuals. So first question, is this the same glove 4.12 that you referred to in the previous findings there? Yes, so glove one is identified as item 4.1. Item 4.1.1 was the swabs taken from the outside pointer finger area. The swabs um, identified as item 4.1.2 were swabs of the inside of that same glove, glove one. So a swab was taken to the inside of the glove, and then as a result of that, um, what did you find? The DNA profile developed from those swabs indicated a mixture of at least three individuals. Due to mixture complexity, no further interpretations will be made. So you can say then on the inside of glove 4.1 that you found the presence of at least three different people's DNA, but because it was mixed and it was too complex, you can't make any other interpretations of it. Correct. Okay. So then the next finding says screening indicated the presence of blood on four areas of glove mm -hmm. 2. So my question is, are we on to another glove now? Correct. This would be what I identified as glove 2, so separate from glove 1. And you did some DNA testing on, um, attempted some DNA testing on swabs from one of the areas on, of the four areas of glove two that indicated the presence of blood in screening? Yes. Okay. So then we see that um, you're finding there. Can you tell us about that finding? The DNA profile developed from the outside middle finger area indicated a mixture of two individuals the profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. So on glove two, on the outside middle finger area, you found the presence of blood. You, you determined that there was two people's DNA in that area, right? That's correct. The major per contributor, the one you could identify as Melody, Correct, that profile matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The second person, you didn't have enough information to make an identification. Correct. But there was definitely somebody else's DNA there. Yes, that profile indicated, indicated a mixture of two individuals. The last finding on this page was, I think that's the additional factors were insufficient to determine. That's what you're talking about, that you couldn't make an identification of the minor contributor. Correct. All right, we'll go on to page three here. And we're still, it looks like we're still talking about what we were talking about before as far as items, the gloves, but now we're moving on to the inside of that glove. Yes, now okay. we're on inside of glove two. Tell us about your findings from the inside of the glove. The DNA profile developed from the swabs from the inside of glove two indicated a mixture of three individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Dakota Van Patten. The probability of finding this profile in a population of unrelated individuals chosen at random would be less than one out of 69 septillion. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profiles of the additional contributors. Okay, so you took, there was a swab that was taken from the inside of this glove too. And was this the same glove where there, uh, the testing on the um, outside middle finger uh, indicated the presence of Melody Hoffman's DNA in an area that screened positive for blood? Yes. Okay. And the inside of that glove, then, the swab taken of there, you were able to find was it three different individuals in there. Yes, that profile indicated a mixture of three individuals. The major contributor you were able to actually develop a profile of, and that uh, matched the known profile of Dakota Van Patten. Yes. And we have a different number here, one out of 69 septillion, but that still exceeds the human population, right? Yes. Well, I don't think we need to go back into that. But 
Um, and then, as far as the other two individuals' DNA found in the inside of the glove, he just didn't have enough information to make a, a profile comparison. But there's definitely two other people's DNA in there. Yes, so there's a mixture of three individuals. That major contributor was determined. And then the rest of the DNA information I could not interpret and therefore can't do any comparisons. So we have a third glove. Yes. Okay, and you identify that as item 4.3. Correct. You did some DNA testing um, on some swabs of some areas um, on glove three. Can you tell us about that DNA testing and, and the results? The DNA profile developed from the outside ring finger area indicated a mixture of three individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profiles of the additional contributors. So we're on glove three, we're on the outside ring finger area, and there's an area that's screened positive for blood. And in that area, you were able to find the major contributor's DNA was Melody, right? Yes. And you have two other people's DNA in there, but you just don't have enough information to identify. Correct. Sometimes people think that if somebody touches something, that necessarily their DNA is going to end up on it and be able to be identified. Is that not always the case? Not always. Okay, why is that? Um, there's many factors that go into whether or not we can interpret a profile. Um, and there's many factors that go into um, how much DNA may be on an item. What are some of those factors? Um, factors for the item itself could be that if an item has been laundered, if an item has been left in heat or humidity or sunlight, those are all things that can damage DNA. There are other factors too. And then um, even if somebody touches something, that doesn't always mean that you're going to leave behind detectable DNA. Um, there also could be multiple people touching an item that can all convolute um, the profile that's developed from a particular area. Is it uncommon in your experience as a DNA forensic examiner to be involved in a case where somebody may have even admitted to touching something but you still can't find a DNA profile to compare to them? I generally don't know the information whether or not somebody has admitted to touching something, so I can't say for sure, because generally I don't know that information. Based upon your experience, is that a conceivable scenario? It is possible that to know somebody has handled something, but we still may not detect an individual's DNA, even if it's known to have been um, used or touched by an individual. Is that something you encountered in your training? Maybe an example of that? Possibly, yes. Um, we did do um, some samples that you know some people have handled, but we still can't um, interpret and associate a portion of a profile or a profile to somebody that we know has touched an item. Essentially, then, is that a surprising finding to you that somebody may have touched something, even admitted to it, but you can't um, develop a DNA profile that's with enough information to do a comparison? It certainly is possible. Not, is that not surprising to you? Not surprising. Okay. So I think we left off on, um, let's see, the top here. Did we talk about the inside of the glove, of glove three? I don't believe so. Okay, let's talk about that. So there's swabs from the inside of that glove, glove three. What did you find when you uh, analyzed that? The DNA profile developed from the swabs from the inside of glove three indicated a mixture of at least three individuals. Due to mixture complexity, no further interpretations will be made. So in essence, then, you've got three different individuals in there, but you didn't have enough information to do uh, develop a profile. There was DNA information there. However, it's just too convoluted. I was not able to pull out specific contributors to that mixture. So uh, the next finding was no stains were noted on glove four. So you looked at glove four, and you just didn't find anything even to analyze. I didn't see any um, stains that I would screen for the presence of blood, and therefore I did not do any DNA testing on that item. Moving on to item number five, which appears to be the pink shirt with red stains and duct tape from the trunk of the Honda. Can you tell us about your examination of that item? 
So item five contained what I called three pieces of an apparent pink shirt with duct tape. No examinations were performed on the apparent hairs on the pieces of the shirt. Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on one area on one piece of the shirt. Screening indicated the presence of blood on five different areas of the same piece of the shirt. DNA testing was attempted on a cutting from the wrist cuff below the tape of that piece of shirt. Okay, so now we have an item that you've described as 5.1.1. Is that the cutting from the wrist cuff below where the duct tape was on this pink shirt? Yes, so I identified the three pieces of the shirt as items 5.1, 5.2 and 5.3. So item 5.1.1 is the cutting from the wrist cuff below the piece of tape on that first piece of the shirt. In that first area, 5.1.1, what did you find? The DNA profile developed indicated a mixture of at least three individuals that was too weak and too complex for conclusive interpretation. Okay, and we've talked about what that finding Um, let's go on to the next finding. Screening indicated the presence of blood on three areas on a separate piece of the shirt. DNA testing was attempted on a cutting from the stained area above the tape, which was the apparent back armpit area. The DNA profile developed matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. So on this pink shirt, uh, in this area that you've identified that you cut from, the second area, 5.2.1, that's where you were able to find the DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. Yes, so this is from the second piece of the apparent shirt, a cutting from one of the stained areas on that piece of the shirt. Let's go on to the next finding then. I think... Um... Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on one area of the remaining piece of the shirt. Screening indicated the presence of blood on three different areas of that same piece of the shirt. DNA testing was attempted on a cutting from the apparent outside back bottom. Okay. So that you're, talking, you're on the back of the shirt now where you cut this? Yes, what a, the apparent outside back bottom. And you call this area 5.3.1? Yes. Okay. And what did you find there? The DNA profile developed matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. Okay, so then moving on to page four of the report, and we're on item number six now, which is the hair stuck to the duct tape from the trunk of the Honda. What did you do with uh, that item? Item six contained duct tape with numerous apparent hairs. Screening indicated the presence of blood on the swabs taken from two areas of the duct tape. The DNA profile developed from the swab taken from a stained area on the smooth side of the tape indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. The DNA profile developed from the swab from a stained area on the sticky side of a tape end indicated a mixture of three individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profiles of the additional contributors. So on this particular piece of duct tape with the numerous hairs, on the smooth side of the tape, you were able to identify as the major contributor Melody Hoffman's DNA, um, but not the other person's DNA on the smooth side. Yes. And then on the uh, sticky side, there's three people, but you were only able to identify one as uh, Melody because she was the major contributor. Yes, it was a mixture of three individuals. The major profile, or major contributor matched the known DNA profile, Melody Hoffman. The additional factors detected were, um, it was insufficient for comparison. Moving on um, to your examination of five hairs there. Uh, tell us about that examination. Five hairs were microscopically evaluated, and the root ends of all five of those hairs were found to be suitable for nuclear DNA testing. The five hairs were sampled for DNA analysis. 
The DNA profile developed from the cuttings of the root portions of those hairs matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. And so when you examined these hairs, then you found uh, the presence of Melody's, uh, Melody's DNA within the root portions of the hair. Yes, so I sampled the root portions of those five hairs and the profile that was developed from um, those hair roots matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. Normally, are you able as a, a DNA forensic um, examiner to identify uh, DNA from hair? Uh, if a hair has a root attached to it, it is, a, um, it is possible to develop a DNA profile. Why is that? The root portion of the hair contains DNA. Um, therefore, there's a chance if there is a root still attached that we can get a DNA profile. And is it your understanding from your biology background that the root is the area of the hair that's connected to the scalp of was the head? Yes, that's the end that is closest to a scalp. And so in order to examine that, not only would you have to have hair removed from the scalp, but the root area removed as well to examine it? Correct. Okay, so um, moving on to item number seven, and that's the two pieces of the paracord knotted together. Can you tell us about your findings there? The DNA profile developed from the knot area and adjacent frayed end of the paracord indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were is insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. Okay, so on this area of the paracord in the knot area in the adjacent freight end, you found uh, Melody's DNA to be the major contributor in that area, and the other uh, person's DNA you just couldn't identify. Correct. What's the next finding? The DNA profile developed from the swabs of the shorter tail of the paracord indicated a mixture of three individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profiles of the additional contributors. So in this area, the shorter tail of the pericord, pericord did you mark that as item 7.2? Yes. Okay. So again, the major contributor you were able to match to the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman? Yes. But in this area, we have the presence of two other individuals besides Melody Hoffman? Yes, it indicated a mixture of three individuals, and the major was matched to Melody Hoffman. The additional factors uh, were insufficient to determine the profiles of those other individuals. And again, does that, um, to clarify, that's overall three distinct individuals? Yes, that profile indicated a mixture of three individuals. Your Honor, may I approach witness? May. Yes, I do. Okay. And what does this contain in your knowledge? Um, that is the bag that contained the green paracord that was submitted for testing. Item number seven up here? Correct. That has laboratory item number seven. Yes, I can see the evidence tape down here on the bottom edges. It has my date and my, uh, my date, excuse me, my initials and dates on the evidence tape seal. So this indicates that you accessed this um, and, and then resealed it? So yes, I would have opened the item down on the bottom edges where my evidence tape seal is. Um, up on top, you can see the item, the days that I examined it, and then down on the bottom, you can see when I was finished with my examinations, this red evidence tape seal indicates the areas that I sealed the item up after completion of my testing. 
Whose notes are these on here? Um, I can see on this particular item, I can see a yellow barcode up here on the top corner. It has the laboratory case and item number. Right underneath of that, I can identify my date, excuse me again, my initials and dates on there. Um, and then there's also a brief item description of what is within the bag. Still on item number seven here. Um, we had talked about the second finding. I think we were down to screening did not indicate the presence of blood on swabs involving the long tail of the paracord. Can you tell us about that finding? Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on the swabs of the unstained portions of the long tails of the paracord. The DNA profile developed indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. So in the long tails of the paracord, you found a mixture of two individuals, but were only able to identify uh, the, the major contributor, that being Melody. Yes, that would be the unstained portions, the apparent unstained portions of those long tails of the paracord. Okay. Moving on to the next finding, I think we're still talking about the paracord. Can you talk about that? Screening indicated the presence of blood on one area of the paracord. The DNA profile developed from the swabs of the stained portion of the paracord indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. So in this area where blood was found on the paracord, that's where you were able to identify two individuals, but the profile of the major contributor was Melody, the other one not able to identify. Correct. Okay, now we're moving on to number eight, which is a knife, pocket knife with red stains from the Honda, right? Yes. Can you tell us about your examination of that item? Screening indicated the presence of blood on swabs of two areas of the knife. The DNA profile developed from a portion of the knife blade and the top edge of the handle indicated a mixture of two individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. And this is an area that you marked as 8.1, that being the... Um portion of the knife blade on and top edge of the handle. Yes. What was your next finding? The DNA profile developed from the scalloped bottom and back edges of the knife handle indicated a mixture of three individuals. The profile of the major contributor matched the known DNA profile of Melody Hoffman. The additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profiles of the additional contributors. So with respect to this uh, knife that was uh, the pocket knife with red stains from the Honda, uh, the first area, 8.1 on the uh, knife, portion of the knife blade and top edge, you found two distinct individuals and were able to identify Melody. Yes, it was a mixture of two. The major contributor was associated to Melody Hoffman. And then the second area that you identified as 8.2, from the scalped bottom and back edges of the knife handle. Yes. And that's where you found uh, three distinct individuals. Yes, that indicated a mixture of three individuals. May I approach the witness, Ron? You may. And the witness must be marked as Stacey Simmons. Yes, I do. Okay. And what is this? This is laboratory item number eight. Um, it has identification on there as pocket knife with red stains. Um, I can see a laboratory yellow barcode with my initials and date that I examined. And I can also see um, 
on the bottom edge here, a area where I read evidence tape sealed it after completion of my testing, which has also um, has my initials and date on there. And is this uh, described as pocket knife with red stains from compartment under radio and on That's what it says on there. All right, moving on to item number 10, which is described as a paper fold containing fingernail scrapings from McKinley Louisma. What kind of testing did you do on that? Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on the swabs of the fingernail scrapings and scraper end. The DNA factors detected were too weak for conclusive interpretation. So no blood on the fingernail scrapings and scrapings and, and no um, not enough factors to develop a DNA profile. There were factors present, but not enough for me to um, interpret that profile that was developed. The next items that you examine are items 11 and 12, which are described as right fingernail clippings collected at the time of autopsy, that's 11, and left fingernail clippings collected at the time of autopsy, that's 12, and this is uh, obviously of Nellie Hoffman. What did you find there? Screening indicated the presence of blood on the swabs of the right and left fingernail clippings and clipper ends. No DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman were detected in the profiles developed. What's that mean? So that just means all of the DNA, the DNA information that was developed in the profile developed from the right fingernail clippings and clipper end, and also the profile from the left fingernail clipping and clipper ends. All the DNA that was detected it was all associated back to Melody Hoffman. There was no DNA foreign to her detected in those profiles. So in this instance, unlike some of the other findings, you didn't even find the presence of other individuals that you could identify? Correct. The profiles developed from these two samples were um, single source. There was only one contributor detected. The next item you examined was item number 13, lab item number 13, the sealed sexual assault kit bearing the name of Melody Hoffman. Taken, taken at the time of the autopsy exam. What did you find there? Screening indicated the presence of blood, but did not indicate the presence of seminal fluid on the oral swabs. One spermatozoon was microscopically identified in the oral sample. No DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman were detected in the profile developed from the epithelial fraction of the oral sample. The DNA factors detected from the sperm fraction of the oral sample were too weak for conclusive interpretation. So this indicates testing done on an oral swab of Melody Hoffman. Yes. And you were able to uh, microscopically identify one spermatozoon. What's that mean? That just means one singular sperm cell. But it looks like even... Uh, after you did that extraction process you talked about earlier that's in the report there, that you didn't have enough from that extraction to um, make an identification from the sperm fraction. Yes, the DNA factors detected from the sperm fraction of the oral sample were too weak for conclusive interpretation. And then from the epithelial fraction of that sample, Melody Hoffman's DNA was there, but you couldn't have, there wasn't enough factors to identify anybody else. The profile from the epithelial fraction of the oral sample was single source, only one contributor detected, and there was no DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman um, detected in that profile. Let's go to your next finding. Screening indicated the presence of seminal fluid on the anal swabs. Can you talk about that? Screening indicated the presence of seminal fluid on the anal swabs. However, no spermatozoa were microscopically observed in the anal sample. No DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman were detected in the profile developed from the epithelial fraction of the anal sample. No DNA profile was developed from the sperm fraction of the anal sample. So then as a result of your uh, analysis of the, okay, the uh, seminal fluid in the anal swab, then again, um, you didn't find a spermatozoa. I did not find any spermatozoa in the anal sample. But you still did the, the um, extraction process to, to look at the epithelial fraction of that? Yes, I still did the differential extraction on the anal swabs. 
So you're going to be a, get an analysis of the epithelial fraction, but not a sperm fraction. So I did um, the epithelial fraction. There was no factors foreign to Melody Hoffman detected. And then in that sperm fraction in the anal sample, there was no DNA profile developed. So there was no um, DNA factors detected in that profile. And the final uh, note here underneath the uh, examination sexual assault kit, screening did not indicate the presence of seminal fluid on the vaginal swabs and no spermatozoa were microscopically observed in the vaginal sample. Just what does that mean? So my screening tests for seminal fluid were negative and I did not identify any spermatozoa in the vaginal sample. So nothing found on the vaginal sample? As far as screening wise, the screening tests were negative and I did not identify any sperm in that sample. Are you able to tell from, well, I guess this, is, this continues on to the next page here. Um, no DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman was detected in the epithelial and Again, DNA factors detected from the sperm fraction. So I guess explain that because if you didn't have the presence of seminal fluid, then you still did an extraction process? Maybe I'm not reading that right. So the screening tests were negative for seminal fluid on the vaginal sample. I still did the differential extraction procedure. And therefore, um, I made a microscopic slide, and I did not identify any spermatozoa on the slide that was created or... Um, the slide um, of the vaginal sample. The epithelial fraction um, profile it was single source and no DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman were detected from the epithelial fraction of that vaginal sample. And then that sperm fraction of the vaginal sample, there was factors detected, but they were just too weak. There's not enough information for me there to draw any conclusions from the DNA detected. The final note here on um, item number 13, the sexual assault kit, says no examinations were performed on the known uh, buckle or blood samples. So you had already gotten a DNA profile from the uh, blood stains from the autopsy, right? Yes, so within the sexual assault kit that was collected at autopsy, there was also buckle samples, or known buckle samples, and also a known blood sample. Separately, there was a laboratory item submitted with a different blood sample from Melody Hoffman. I simply just chose to take that blood sample as opposed to taking the ones that were in the sexual assault kit. To be clear here, as we move on from the sexual assault kit examination, when it comes to uh, detecting seminal fluid in these areas, is, is there any way for you as a DNA forensic um, analyzer to determine or conclude when the, those samples will be deposited? No, based on our DNA testing, I can't um, say when a particular, when DNA was deposited, nor can I say how DNA was deposited. Moving on here, uh, now we're on item number 14, which is the underwear of the victim. So Melody Hoffman's underwear, what kind of testing did you do on that? Screening did not indicate the presence of seminal fluid on the swabs from the inside crotch area of the underwear. No DNA factors foreign to Melody Hoffman were detected in the profile developed, and I did not examine uh, the apparent hairs that were present on the underwear. Okay. Moving on to item number 16. So now we're on to a different set of items here. This is a swab from the unknown flaky yellow substance at Morgan Creek Park, which I think we've seen pictures of already in this trial. What kind of uh, analysis did you do on that? Uh, screening did not indicate the presence of blood on the swabs taken from Morgan Creek Park, um, specifically laboratory item 16, the DNA profile developed from the unknown substance sample indicated a mixture of two individuals. The partial profile of the major female contributor was determined. Further interpretation may be attempted if known DNA samples from potential sources are submitted. Melody Hoffman, McKinley Luisma, Dakota Van Patten, and Logan Kimpton were eliminated as the source of the DNA profile that was developed. And the additional factors present were insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. So for item lab number items 16 through 19, which are these the swabs from the flaky yellow substance in Morgan Creek Park, the dried food in the parking lot, the unknown amber substance north of the picnic table, 
in the swab of the unknown substance from the south of the picnic table, um, at least when it comes to the flaky substance, you eliminated all four of these individuals as a source of DNA. Yes, those four individuals were eliminated as the source of the major female profile that was developed from the sample. And then for um, the dried fluid on the parking lot, 17, and the unknown substance from the south of the picnic table, that's 19. For 17 and 19, um, you didn't find any DNA profile. Correct. No pro DNA profiles were developed from the parking lot and south of picnic table samples. And then for the unknown amber substance north of the picnic table, um, it looks like and that's number 18. There's some DNA there, but it, you didn't have enough information to make an interpretation. Correct. Okay, so moving on to number 20, we're on to the clear, excuse me, clear frame glasses right now. Tell us about your analysis of the clear frame glasses. The DNA profile developed from the swabs from the temple tips and nose pieces of the glasses indicated a mixture of two individuals. The partial profile of the major contributor was consistent with the known DNA profile of Dakota Van Patten. The probability of finding this profile in a population of unrelated individuals chosen at random would be less than one out of 2.6 septillion. The additional factor present was insufficient to determine the profile of the minor contributor. So on these glasses, there's two people, but um, you had enough information on, from the partial profile to identify the major contributor as being consistent with Mr. Van Patten. Yes. And that's from the temple tips and nose piece of the glasses? Yes. But the other persons um, that you identified there just didn't have enough information for? Correct. Okay, moving on to uh, item number 21, which is a pair of Nike gray shoes. Can you tell us about your analysis of that item? Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on eight areas of the left shoe and six areas on the right shoe. No DNA testing was attempted on this item. So you didn't have anything that was shown to indicate the presence of blood, so you didn't do any testing? Correct. Okay, so item number 22, then, is the gray sweatpants. You said no examination was performed on that. Do you remember why that was? I had spoken to Special Agent Kedley prior to um, processing the items in this case, and given the sheer number of items that were submitted, I asked if there was any way we could kind of slim down and kind of focus our testing at that time. And at that time, he decided this was one of the items that um, did not need to be examined on the first round of DNA testing. We also have a uh, forest green Under Armour sweatshirt, which is item number 23 here. Um, tell us about your examination of that item. No stains were noted on the sweatshirt, and no DNA testing was attempted on that sweatshirt. So nothing even to screen? I did not find any areas suitable for screening. Moving on to page 7. We're on item number 24, which is the pink Hey Do shoes. Uh, can you tell us about your um, analysis of that item? Screening did not indicate the presence of blood on two areas of the left shoe and two areas of the right shoe. Screening indicated the presence of blood on one area of the left shoe. The DNA factors detected from the swabs of the top toe box of the left shoe were too weak for conclusive interpretation. So screening indicates blood present, but not enough information to make a conclusion. Correct. Moving on to item number 25, which is the um, black capri pants. Is that right? Yes. Is that one another one where um, Special Agent Kelly said, we don't need to look at that? Correct. Just trying to save you some work because of all the... Yes, there were um, numerous items submitted for the first round of testing. Item number 26 is... The multicolor cell phone case. Tell us about your examination of that. The DNA profile developed from the swabs of the buttons on the side of the phone case indicated a mixture of at least two individuals that was too weak for conclusive interpretation. Okay. So I think we know from your testimony what that means there. Um, finally, number 28 is the black beanie. 